Okay, we're back. It's one o'clock. It's a given Tuesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and more specifically, it's Community Matters. And even more specifically, Peter Hoffenberg is on the show um, to discuss an interesting topic, which has been in the press globally in the last few days, weeks. Uh, and it's the, the Orthodox, Jewish Orthodox protests against COVID social distancing protocols. Hi, Peter. Hello, how are you? Good to see you. Good. Yeah. I'm, I'm enjoying my, my hermitage. Nice, uh, I can see it. Your wife went shopping for you, that's a nice shirt. I'm, Lovely. I'm, I'm in good shape. You are. So let, let's talk about, you know, not, not all the Jews feel the same way that the Orthodox feel. Um, and the Hasidic Jews uh, everywhere in the world um, live in a world of um, proximity, if you will. They pray, uh, they spend time with family. It's a very tacti tactical, tact what am I looking for? Tactile. Tactile. It's a tactile kind of experience. They, they need to be near their families. It's, it's almost a, it is a religious thing. Can you describe to me, to the extent you know, you know what it's like to be an Orthodox Jew in an Orthodox Jewish family? Sure, uh, as, as much as I can. I think you're absolutely right about the proximity. And some of that proximity for our viewers uh, might be unusual for them to think about, but you have to live within walking distance of the synagogue. So on a holiday and particularly on Shabbat, you are not allowed to perform any work, which means unlike most Jews in America, they can't get in their car and drive to synagogue. So they tend to live in a concentrated area, but for reasons that really make sense for their worldview and their understanding of the Torah. Uh, the New York situation is also more compact because there's actually a housing crisis in that community. So many of the buildings, and I think people in Hawaii would appreciate that. I mean, many of the residences are multi-generational like they are here. Um, and so you have probably um, not only more people living within proximity, but people who are related. So they tend to be, as you say, more, more tactile. So at least in the New York case, um, some of the issues have been because of the density in which they live, which have both economic and uh, religious uh, reasons. Uh, the reference to tactile is uh, important as long as we also sort of stretch it out a little bit. That unlike um, many religious people who uh, go to services out of obligation or duty, and uh, they look at it as a couple of moments to either sleep or catch up on their texting, uh, Orthodox Jews really relish the religious experience. It's supposed to be joyful. There's it's, dancing. it's total. It is absolutely. So I mean, you know, the the idea of a wedding, the idea of a wedding like, right? Sorry, uh, the idea of a wedding like the one that uh, was canceled last week, uh, including ten thousand people, is not unusual, because when you have a wedding or what's called a simcha, a joyous occasion, it's open to everybody. So I think that. Uh, perhaps uh, listeners who are not as um, conversant or aware of this community uh, might think of it as a fundamentalist community, but I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean, people who take religion seriously, not separated from the rest of their lives, want to live with co-religionists, and want to celebrate that. Okay, so I don't mean fundamentalist in the way that's thrown around as a criticism. Okay, so with that as background, um, I want to add just a few little things. Um, not all Orthodox Jews are the same. So in New York, there are particular Orthodox communities which are having this problem, and there are other Orthodox uh, Jewish communities which are putting masks on. All right, so there are various different Orthodox communities. They generally follow a spiritual leader, uh, and that spiritual leader uh, who is down one street might very well never talk to the spiritual leader down the other street. Okay, so even though the press says Orthodox Jews and says Orthodox Jews in New York, it's not all Orthodox Jews and it's not all Orthodox Jews in, in New York. And it's certainly not all Jews. Oh, absolutely not. But also not all Orthodox Jews. And again, probably some of your listeners and yourself and I have some experience with New York. So this also can't be extricated from New York. So years ago, there was the Crown Heights incident in which a Jewish driver inadvertently ran over an African-American. Uh, there was a stabbing of an Australian 
Orthodox Jew by an African American. The New York New York has its own memory, and so when you talk about this issue, uh, those folks in the community don't divorce this issue from their history, which is not in any reason, any way to say that there's something inherently tense racially. Actually, most people in New York get along very well, yeah, but this happens. Right. This this happens to be an area where there's a history. Uh, and I would say that the current administration with uh, Mayor Blasio, de Blasio um, has a little bit of a history also of trying to control the Orthodox gatherings, but to be honest, also control most other gatherings other than the Black Lives protests, uh, public protests and other ones. But many of those have, of course, people wearing masks. So they're not, again, you know, critics of him are not playing on exactly the same level, because if you look at those protests, uh, most people have masks, and even there's some social distancing. But you know, if you're an Orthodox Jew, it would not be unusual for you to look out your window and say, well, look, these people are marching. Why can't I have my wedding? And there are good reasons not to have the wedding, but I mean, that's going through uh, the mentality. So does that help introduce the issue, the issue a little bit? Yeah, uh, there's yeah, also, yeah. of course, there's also the bigger issue. I mean, the, the massive issue, uh, which is a collision of public health and public safety with the interpretation of religious freedoms, right? That's sort of the, the heart and soul. And in that case, certainly Orthodox Jews are not alone. There are other congregations, including Christian congregations, which have been, have been holding their meetings as a defense of religious freedom. And that, that's not uncommon at all. I mean, if uh, this is New York, uh, so it gets a lot of attention, but there are churches throughout the country. And some of the super spreaders, in fact, early on were church services um, in which uh, people were not wearing masks and not socially distancing. So I guess that's sort of the larger issue, which is religious freedom as a public interest versus health. That's a public well, in, in that regard, I think we ought to talk a little bit about the measles because um, there were a number of, again, Orthodox congregations right. in New York who didn't want to do uh, measles vaccinations and uh, they paid a price for that. Yes, yes, can, certainly. Can you talk about it? Um, I want to talk about it, uh, but but not again in my, I mean, in my usual way. Remember, I'm not representing <laughs> UH and um, I'm not an, orth an expert by any means on the Orthodox community, but I think um, they're similar, but not exactly the same. So uh, the vaccination issue, like anti-vaccine people across the country um, is, yes, uh, a little bit of divinity. God will, God will protect us and, and some suspicion as, as well. So in that case, um, you're also the, let's, let's be honest, dealing with some people who um, feel more comfortable being separated from what we would think of as the real world. And again, I don't want to re use real in a better or worse term or a pejorative term. Um, so measles is, of course, an invasion from the real world, but so is the vaccine, so is trusting a vaccine. I don't think the orthodox argument is, is the standard argument that vaccines will cause autism. I haven't- No, no, I, I, I haven't- I Right, so that, that's a common argument you hear from anti-vaccine people based yeah. on absolutely no evidence at all. Uh, yeah. Theirs is not that, I think theirs is, uh, religious freedom, but also religious freedom uh, in which, like the Shakers, I mean, they live in their own community. So medicine isn't just not godlike. Medicine is quite often something from the outside. Now, having said that, though, again, let's recognize that there are Orthodox doctors. There are Orthodox frontliners who have gotten COVID. Uh, it's, it's even possible the nurse holding the kids who did get vaccinated was orthodox. So I, I think we've got to be really careful here. Um, and I don't blame the media because there are millions of stories. But again, we got to be careful about the labels and understanding these folks. So some certainly thought of uh, the vaccinations like they think of the masks, for example, as not being necessary or not, not being in God's uh, way, uh, in God's plan. But there are also those who did get vaccinated, right? The, the great difficulty, as you know, is it just takes a couple of people not being vaccinated or a couple of people not wearing masks. Well, sure, right? that makes so sense. if this were something, you know, 
If this were some other issue, which were not a public health issue, we might not be having this discussion. I mean, I'm sure there are other examples in the Orthodox community where people have refused some kind of medical care, but it has been a personal, right? It's a personal choice. Uh, this okay, one, obviously, so, the competing uh, interest is public health. So you mentioned, you know, it's a balance of religious, religious principles, religious freedom and science. And when I say science, I mean the science of epidemiology, uh, because it's clear, you know, you, you don't have to be a, a scientist to know that if you if you get infected with something that is infectious and you don't take steps to protect the next person, you wind up with a whole community that's infected. And, you know, I mean, that's a, a rational person would, would come to that conclusion very, very quickly. And there are many people in this country, especially in the, you know, especially in this country who don't buy into that. They think it's a matter of their personal liberty and they, they don't see that it's an epidemiological phenomenon. So what, what do the Orthodox say about that? Surely they have an answer. Uh, they have an answer, but I don't want to um, misquote it. So let me say that the, the answer is often, again, in their minds, religious freedom, but also in their minds, uh, a celebration really of, of God and divinity and God will protect them. And if God will not protect them, the costs of not living the religious life are too great. But again, I, I encourage your listeners uh, to try to find um, official expressions of the Orthodox community, which will yeah. be many. But one of them certainly is, um, and perhaps secularists don't appreciate, you know, seculars may not see not celebrating religion as a particularly high cost. So many secularists would argue really in the balance, public health clearly triumphs. And I'm not really losing a lot. I'm not really losing a lot. I'm not going to church or the mosque, the meeting hall or the synagogue. But we have to try to understand the other framework and the other worldview in which not celebrating God, not celebrating with co-religionists is uh, basically too high a cost. It's uh, robbing them of what they think of as the essence of their, their lives. And in order for us, I mean, even if we disagree with that, I think in order for us as a society or a political community, um, we gotta recognize that and deal with that uh, not dismiss it, not demonize it, but try to uh, negotiate essentially and remind people of these other costs. Um, and that's really part of kind of a plebiscite, part of a discussion, um, which I think as we've talked about before with, uh, with Mark, just can't work on social media. I mean, it, it requires, you know, somebody from the city of New York sitting down with the rabbi uh, and personalizing it. I just, I just think the way that things are just going now, people are so with, uh, within their own steadfast positions that they're not even, they're not willing to practice any kind of a mor moral imagination because of the sense that, like if you practice moral imagination, you're giving up the battle or there's something wrong with you, which I don't, I personally, I, I don't think at all. You can hold very steadfast to your principles, hold them forever and still try to, morally imagine what the other person is, is going through. Unless you want to resolve this, you know, in a coercive and alienating way. And I, except for a few people, I don't think. I mean, obviously there are people who are willing, who are willing to be coercive and willing to be alienating. But for the, for the rest of us, I think we prefer a different mode. There's, um, <clears throat> you know, in, in, in Michigan, uh, where they invaded the uh, state house and, um, and in, in the face in the name of personal liberties, even constitutional liberties, mm -hmm. the liberty of being liberated from a mask. Uh, it's the same you know, lack of interest in protecting the community. It's, uh, I mean, the larger community. It's, it's uh, they believe the constitution offers them this, this constitutional right. Um, and uh, there, are, there are those uh, religious groups in the country, not, not the Jews at all, not, not the Orthodox, uh, you know, who, who um, are, they're cultists. Uh, and they follow uh, Trump's, uh, you know, leadership on the point, uh, and they they do they believe in a, sort of an alternate reality, but it's different. And, and you have various groups for various reasons with various mechanics, 
all coming to pretty much the same conclusion. Uh, that is, I, I have an absolute right to do this. Leave me alone to do my thing. Now, what's interesting in New York is uh, de Blasio and also uh, Andrew Cuomo they come around and say 10,000 people at a wedding. That's made for a super spreader. We're not going to let you do that. Now that we have notice of what you're doing, it's incumbent on us as government to stop you. That's not unreasonable in any way. And I suppose there were efforts to try to meet. I know there were efforts to try to mediate this, but those efforts failed because you know people were locked on their their beliefs. And, right. Well, they did. They did have the wedding, and it was small. It was not. Right. Oh yes, that's right. They reduced it to like right. fifty so, or something. Right? I, right. Which is still a problem, but. Uh, a lot of times, competing public interests require compromise. Yeah. They, they, they do, and, and certainly fifty is yeah, is probably forty nine too large. I guess 48, 43, <laughs> 47, because you probably need to the rabbi and the couple. Uh, but certainly, I think we can all agree that uh, an invitation of eleven thousand people would boggle any kind of tracing. I think um, I agree with you um, about the basic points of my rights. Um, tr Trump, so to speak, with a little T, the public interest. But I think students of religion would find it interesting that the Orthodox have no desire for martyrdom, right? The Orthodox have no desire to go and uh, stake out Cuomo's house and practice uh, firing weapons and kidnap him. Part of the problem, I think, with the Christian extremists is they have a kind of martyrdom complex. I mean, when you think about it, 13 people are probably not actually gonna be able to uh, kidnap. They're a bit more like the, the young man who walked into and worshiped in the South Carolina uh, church and then murdered the people around him. He was willing to die for it. That's kind of martyrdom. I, I think that's a little bit different. Some of these uh, folks uh, on, the, on the general political right, and more often than not, they are Christians, which is, not to, I mean, most Christians have nothing to do with it, but they think of themselves as Christians, really kind of have a Jesus martyr complex. Yeah. Whereas the Orthodox, you know, they, they protested, they did, and they had a little bit of a riot, but they have no interest. They have, they have no interest in dying for the cause. Yeah. yeah. Which, which makes them um, a public health problem, but not necessarily a public safety problem. In other words, uh, there are no domestic terrorists in that orthodox community. No, no. Um, there are how challenges. dedicated they would be because of the notion of, of minion. You know, uh, I remember I was in Tahiti one time and, and they had nine individuals who were, who were going to have a service and they were looking all over the all over Tahiti to find a tenth person to make the requirement for the minion. And they found me. And I was happy to do it. But they would not have had the service. They would have been frustrated right. beyond description if they didn't have that one extra person. And well, there's, so, always answer, there's always one answer, but which they don't want to hear, is they can invite a woman. Yes, well, that, that then it'd be easy to have, then it'd be easy to have that, that didn't occur to them. I know, I know, but then the ten would be quite easy. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the New, the New York experience was, in a funny way, Peter, was a success. It was a negotiated result. I think the government did the right thing by you know, putting the heat on them. Um, and the, they both did the right thing by coming to a solution. Um, 50 may not be a, you know, a perfect solution, but it's a lot, it's a lot better than 10,000, right. which they, right. they definitely would have I had. think you saw some other significant differences. So for example, uh, the White House wasn't egging on the protests, right? The White House gave no support to the protests and the White House did not attack the governor. Okay, that's very important, right? It was, it was a local issue in many cases. Right. Um, and secondly, uh, there was no outside funding for the protests. So really the Orthodox Jews were, as their mentality is, really talking about themselves. They right. didn't need or want White House support. They didn't need or want whoever the funders are on the other side. So it really was a, you know, a New York issue, which was resolved within New York. And I think for everybody that's beneficial because yeah. uh, as we know, when uh, issues like that become public and global, uh, they just scratch the scab off of anti-Semitism. I mean, it had the potential, it had the potential to be another 
poster moment for anti-Semites. Do, do you think it was in any way? Well, um, I I don't, um, and I don't even I don't think De Blasio was either. Um, but I think De Blasio and Cuomo have to publicly explain why the protests are acceptable, and I think they can do that. But if you just look at the optics, it does seem odd that there can be protests and there can't be weddings. And I think there are reasons, but it's another case of uh, public figures. And, and you know, some people just want to see. There'll always be some deputies. But if you're talking about the majority of the people in the middle who want to hear an explanation and say, okay, you know what, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think I don't think it was anti-Semitic. And you know me. I find anti-Semitism everywhere. So I really don't think it was. I, do, I think Cuomo handled it better than de Blasio. I think um, this is too much for de Blasio. I just, you know, as a politician. And let's be honest, I mean, outside of being the commissioner major of the baseball, um, the governor, um, the, the mayor of New York is the single most difficult political position. It's much easier to be president of the United States. So I, I just think that, I, I mean, de Blasio, might very well be a good guy. I just think he's he's in over his head, not of his own doing. But uh, I just think this is no. too much. Of it it uh, shows you how this sort of thing stresses government. Absolutely, you know, COVID stresses government in every way imaginable. But let me let me move to Israel mm -hmm. because we we've had a parallel um, you know series of events in Israel um, over the same thing: the Orthodox and the rules about uh, COVID and distancing and masks and and religious events. Can you talk about how, how it has unfolded in Israel? Right, well, I guess uh, we probably your, your um, viewers and listeners know that Israel has had an intense rate, a very high rate, and I, they may be on their second wave already. Um, I think um, one of the differences is though, that in Israel, the uh, religious community plays a very important political role. So there really wasn't much of a political cost for de Blasio or Cuomo to ask the Orthodox Jews not to have a big, uh, <clears throat> a big wedding. Um, many of them don't even vote. Uh, there are probably some Trump supporters there, but we're not talking you right about a really soon. So we're not talking about the equivalent of Christian evangelicals, right? That's a political purpose. But I think your listeners and viewers have to rethink Israel where in order for, for example, Netanyahu and Likud to hold the government, they can't piss off the religious communities. And so that makes in many ways much more difficult. Um, and I would say that some communities in Israel are handling it well, others not by any means at all. It's, it's a, it is a con convergence of a political crisis for Netanyahu who's being charged with corruption. Um, the constant tensions with uh, uh, Palestinians and Arab Israelis, which your viewers know about, um, and combining that with the COVID has uh, really overwhelmed, I think, um, the Israeli government. And it's just kind of, it's stasis, just the whole thing back. Um, I would recommend if you have time, uh, there's an excellent Haaretz journalist, uh, Alison Kaplan Summer, who would be happy to talk with you about that resume. And that I think would be an excellent guest for yourself and your viewers. Uh, she, she lives there. She could give you uh, really a good accounting of politics and COVID in Israel. I can only give you what I've read, including things by her. But I, but I think for your viewers, that's important. It's just a vital political difference, right? <laughs> I mean, can, no you tell our, can you tell our audience um, what, what Haaretz is? Okay, so Haaretz, Haaretz is uh, probably the most popular Israeli newspaper, which tends to be, if you need a spectrum, tends to be to the left, but it's not a communist or socialist newspaper, uh, will we'll publish editorials and articles which will be critical of the Israeli government, um, including labor governments, and has um, a significant number of editorial writers who are uh, sympathetic, often for very good reasons, to the Palestinians and the Arab Israelis. So it's not the voice box of the government by any means at all. Um, I don't think there's a direct analogy, but maybe maybe the Washington Post or the New York Times, in the sense that it's a very reputable news outlet. A lot of American and, news in it. A lot yeah, of American and, news. Yeah, and it tends to take a, 
uh, seriously Jefferson's charge the fourth estate must be critical of government. Mm. Um, so um, Netanyahu, how well has he done? It doesn't sound like he's, he's done very well dealing with this issue uh, in Israel. Uh, the Orthodox uh, don't agree with him, and uh, he's a little, he's stuck. He is stuck he, a little he, bit. he can't really solve the problem. Right, because he needs them politically. I would be very wary, though, drawing too much of a parallel between, say, the Brazilian president, the American president, and Netanyahu about this issue. Uh, because Netanyahu's never publicly mocked science, for example. Like, he knows, he knows masks have to be worn. So his is a clear, and, and maybe Trump believes in science and Balseri, I don't know, but they, they don't say they believe in science. And Netanyahu would never <laughs> go out and say that, not, not in Israel, where <laughs> you know, three quarters of the scientific and medical patents every month come out. Uh, so I think his is really a, a strictly political problem. And as many of your viewers know, uh, Israel is not, uh, parallel to the United States politically, it's parallel to Britain and Germany, where you need a coalition government. It's very rare for one party to have enough of a majority to run the government. So sometimes you have to make concessions, sometimes hold your nose and make concessions so you can actually have a government. And that's been Netanyahu's case now for several elections where he's sometimes only one or two people short, but those one or two people generally are either of the religious community or very closely affiliated with them. So you might see a picture and the individual might, might or might, well, probably would be wearing a yarmulke, but maybe not wearing the black, the black clothes that your viewers are used to seeing in Orthodox. But that person would be in good standing with probably the Orthodox community. So um, take, take what's happening in Israel, which is kind of a stalemate. I mean, it's, I think it's more than a political problem. It's a public health problem. And, and part of the reason that it's a public health problem is that people don't follow you know, the protocols on, on masks and distancing. And there are a lot of orthodox in Israel and that's gotta have some kind of salient uh, demographic effect. Um, but anyway, you, you, you take what's going on in Israel and what's going on in Brooklyn and, and other locations where the orthodox uh, or orthodox people you know, are, mm, are, are taking this kind of position um, where is it all going? I mean, we have, we have a, a, a COVID crisis here and there, both. Um, and it, it seems to me that, that the government ought to come down on it because the, the bottom line is we cannot afford to, do, to allow anything um, you know, that, that, that perpetuates the infection. I'm thinking of China where they, you know, you, you want to perpetuate the infection, you go to a retraining camp. They're not kidding around. And right. they have been very successful right now. They have a, just a minimal number of cases going on in all of China. Uh, you got to hand it to them for that. But ultimately, if we keep going up and up and up, whether Biden wins or not, and the government can't do anything about it, doesn't do anything about it, somebody has to do something. And so this, this is a, a problem that is not resolved in either place. I mean, what happened in Brooklyn is not a resolution a long-term resolution. It's a resolution of one event. Um, and, and somewhere along the line, there's got to be a crunch, don't you think? I, I agree with you, there will be a crunch. But I think the parallels, uh, say, for example, with China, just don't work. When we remind ourselves, the public health questions are not divorced from everything else. They're not divorced from political culture. They're not divorced from social interaction. Uh, so yes, China has done a quote-unquote good job in this regard, but I think uh, most people be very reluctant to accept the larger costs for that. So I could see uh, Homo and Blasio's strategy as, you're right, not eradicating it, but very carefully trying to manage by trying to get the community leaders on board to at the very least restrict these large super spreaders. Uh, the one difference might be, and this is not a partisan position, but uh, if we're, if one party were, one presidential candidate, were to win, um, I think the tone of wearing a mask in public on a regular basis would provide a helpful message. Um, it would at least uh, distance those who do not 
from accepting normal behavior. And that's not a partisan thing. Your viewers are not listening to hear my, my politics. It's just an analysis that, you know, in places where uh, the duly elected political leaders, and that includes locally, right? And they've taken on masks. Okay, some people will be angry because they never like them. But again, you know, the people kind of in the middle who are deciding what to do, that's, that's a validation of acceptable behavior. We always talk about negative behavior as validating people. So for example, a president or Chancellor X does this, which is nasty, and people can be nasty. And that, that may be true, but the reverse also works. Uh, and you can think about things that FDR did, uh, things, uh, things that Carter did, that are motivations for you know, moral behavior, not just immoral behavior. Um, I think it's gonna take that. Uh, I am not a scientist, but I listen to most scientists uh, or beat, I should say, not listen. And herd men, the herd argument is not going to work. The herd immunity argument is not going to work. So I fear that what the CDC is predicting is going to be a really devastating winter. And I fear that. Well, you know, one thing that strikes me, and I, I would make a, a speculative prediction that even in a closed community phenomenon like this uh, in, in Brooklyn or in, in Israel, um, if you have people who don't follow the rules, I mean, the, the COVID rules, uh, and in close proximity, and, and, you, and you're doing this, they're doing this because of, you know, religious principles and religious life, so to speak. But, but what, you, what you get at the end of the day, in reality, in science, is a very intense infection. And th that little community, you know, which doesn't want to be decimated, uh, is at risk for decimation. And uh, these fellows are going to look around and notice that half their relatives are sick and their mm -hmm. elderly people are in the hospital. And it's just a tragedy all around them. They can say, gee, maybe we have to rethink this because it isn't working. And, and maybe we have to rebalance these two considerations. Do you think that will right. happen, Peter? I don't, I don't know the community well enough. I think that's probably true of other communities as well. Or if this is going to work, this have, we're going to have to be local police and, and set it. And I don't mean police in a coercive way. I mean, uh, local rules and regulations. But the government is going to have to reach out and make sure it has those allies at the local level. I, I think from what I know about this last community is most people follow their rabbi. And if the rabbi says masks, then most likely. I mean, you know, two Jews, three opinions. We know that. <laughs> okay, and the whole basis of Talmud is debate, debate and discussion. But on, mo on many issues, and it's not on like uh, uh, Christians or Muslims who listen to their religious leaders as well. That's not uncommon. I mean, it's only the Quakers that are democracy. No other religious organization is really democratic but the Quakers. Uh, I think that's what's going to happen to take. I'm hoping that they, the backstory of the wedding is um, negotiation between the rabbi and the state of New York and the city of New York, and that that rabbi will then help set a precedent. That's my, because I, I agree with you when you not only live for religious reasons close to each other, but as you talked about at the start, because of housing cost reasons, you're asking, yeah, you're asking for a mini epidemic, a decimated epidemic. No, I, I, I agree. Well, one, one thing is clear is that um, things that we have assumed, things that we have held on to, in our lives or maybe in our cultures that have lasted for hundreds, thousands of years that, that we have treated as mainstream, um, you know, part of, you know, fundamental points of living, not only in the Orthodox community, but in every community. Uh, those, those things are being tested, like government is being tested. Our society is being tested. Uh, and at the end of this, if there is ever an end, at the end of the tunnel as we are in it now, we'll find that a lot of things we made assumptions about are, are changed. And I, this will be one of them, but there's thousands of others. And it's, that's why you and I can have these shows, you know, ad infinitum uh, to evaluate all the changes that are happening around us. There's, there's no end to it, Peter. Right. <laughs> and I agree with you. The only point I'd add is that, and you know this as well, that uh, a lot of these criticisms and a lot of cracks have been there for a long time. The crisis has opened them up, right? Look, uh, the militia has been around for a long time. Those, those guys in uh, Michigan, many of their parents were members of 
of the militia, right? So yeah. it's, it, to a certain degree, it's a matter of the exposure. Right? There's a whole philosophy about you know, setting yeah. catastrophes. Yeah. Yeah, one of the big differences is, is does a catastrophe create problems which were not there before, or just, just does it open up things to reveal what had been there before? And I think, yeah. I think what's happening with us, and it's, you know, it doesn't mean it's easier to solve necessarily or not, uh, but I think most of the things we're seeing, let's say, for example, an attack on regulations, there have been people, right, since the EPA, since before the ink on the EPA documents dry, they were already, all right. So uh, in a way, it's folks who were on the margins, who have been fighting for a long time, or in the Bureau of Law, they've been there. Now, it's also true that there are certain new issues and that, and the scientists know that. I mean, trying to figure out the nature of this virus, you know, and exactly how it's transferred doesn't map exactly to the epidemic in 1918. And, and that does mean there's certain new things, but a lot of things that worry you and me and keep us up at night, or just keep me up at night besides the Dodgers, is, uh, are, are issues which really have been around. Uh, they just not had the kind of street cred. Uh, and it's an old argument and we've talked about it many, many times, but it's not incorrect just because it's old. Uh, one of the big differences is social media. Big difference, right? And you know big that, difference. Right? We all, everybody agrees and that's not nothing very on my part by any means at all, but it's allowed people who are distant, it's allowed people who are visible, uh, not always to um, actually create a movement necessarily, but give them the impressions that they have that's very dangerous, right? The impression that you have a lot of followers or a movement or people seem to agree with you. That can be almost as dangerous as actually happening. And, and that's, and again, we talked about this, but just to remind you and your listeners, there have been other times like that in history, like the printing press. A lot of the advantages and disadvantages and regulations and fears were there at the printing press. They were there at the telegraph in the 19th century. A lot of very similar issues with, of course, the reminder that nothing, nothing can replace pushing buttons, right? And in two seconds, somebody has to around the world. That, I'm, so I'm not saying they're exactly the same, definitely not equivalent, but a lot of things that worry us, like, is something true? Well, they worried about that with the printing press, right? Uh, yeah. Are you connecting international movements? Well, they worried about that with the television, right? But who could have access? Uh, we worry about every single kid in Hawaii, having access to Wi-Fi so they can be educated. Well, the telegraph didn't go everywhere, so there were pockets of people who were not. So I'm not I'm not flattening it out. I'm just saying that history helps us a little bit think through uh, not equivalencies uh, but comparisons. Yeah, there you go. There you go again. History Sorry. helps us. Sorry, <clears throat> it doesn't but it helps, but doesn't answer. It, does, <laughs> it helps, but doesn't answer. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. I so enjoy our discussion. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. Take care of yourself. Take care um, of yourself. Speak to you soon, unless the world becomes perfect. <laughs> Stay safe. Okay, Aloha. you too. Bye-bye. <laughs>